It's the Cube, covering the virtual Vertica Big Data Conference 2020, brought to you by Vertica. Hi everybody, welcome back. You're watching the Cube's coverage of the Vertica Virtual Big Data Conference. It was, of course, going to be in Boston at the Encore Hotel. <laughs> Win big with with big data, new casino. But ob obviously, coronavirus has changed all that. Our hearts go out, and our we we our empathy to those people who are struggling. We are going to continue our wall-to-wall -wall coverage of this conference, and we're here with Larry Lancaster, who's the founder and CTO of Zebrium. Larry, welcome to the Cube. Thanks for coming on. Hi, right, thanks for having me. You're welcome. So, first question: Why did you start Zebrium? Yeah, you know, I don't know. So, I've been dealing with machine data a long time. So, so for those of you who don't know what that is, you know, if you can imagine servers or whatever goes on in a data center or, you know, in a SaaS shop, um, there's data coming out of those servers, out of those applications, and basically, you can build a lot of cool stuff on that. Um, so there's a lot of metrics that come out and there's a lot of log files that come out. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I built this, basically spent my career building that sort of thing. So, you know, tools on top of that or products on top of that. The problem is that since at least log files are completely unstructured, it's, it's always doing the same thing over and over again, which is, you know, going in and understanding the data and, you know, extracting the data and all that stuff. It's very time consuming. If you've done it like five times, you don't want to do it again. So really, my 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 uh, idea was, you know, at this point with machine learning where it's at, there's there's got to be a better way. So, so Zebrium was was founded on the notion that we can just do all that automatically. We can take a pile of uh, machine data, we can turn it into a database, and we can build stuff on top of that. And so the company is really all about bringing that bringing that uh, value to to the market. That's cool. I want to get into that um, and just better understand kind of who you're disrupting and understand that opportunity better. But before I do, tell us a little bit about your background. You've got kind of an interesting background, a um, lot, lot of tech chops. Um, yeah. Give us some color there. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, I started in the Valley, I guess, 20 years ago when, uh, when my son was born. I left grad school. I was in grad school over at Berkeley uh, Biophysics and I, I realized I need to go get a job. So I ended up, uh, starting in software and i've been there ever since i mean uh spent a lot of time at uh sort of i guess i cut my teeth at netapp which was a storage company and then i uh co-founded a, a business called glassbeam which was kind of an etl database company um and then uh and then after that i went to i ended up at nimble storage uh another company emc ended up buying the glassbeam so i went over there and and after Nimble, though, which where I built the InfoSight platform, that's where I kind of, you know, after that, I was able to to step back and take a year and a half and, and just go into my basement. Actually, this is my kind of workspace here and uh, and and come up with the technology and actually build it so that I could go raise money and get a team together to to build Zebrium. So, so that's really my career in a nutshell. And you got Hello Kitty over your right shoulder, which is that's kind right. of cool. And, that's right. Uh, and then. And then up to the oh, left, yeah. you got your monitor, right? Well, I, I had it. it. It's over here, yeah. So, oh, it was so, great. Pull it out. Pull it out. Let me see it. So, okay. okay. Right. So you got that. So what do you do? You just sit there and code all night, or that's right? So, but, that's right. So, so Hello Kitty's over here. So mm -hmm. I have a daughter, and she, you know, set up the, my workspace here on the on, on this side with Hello Hello Kitty and so on. And over on this side, I've got my recliner where I basically lay it all the way back, and then I pivot this thing down over my face and put my keyboard on my lap and I could just sit there for like 20 hours. It's great. Completely comfortable. That's, that's cool. All right. Better put that monitor <laughs> back on. You guys are yelling at me. Uh, but so uh, obviously we're talking to somebody with, with serious coding chops. And I also add that the Nimble Info, info site, I think it was one of the best pickups that H, HP, HPE has had in, in a while. And the thing that interested me about that, Larry, is the ability that the company was able to take that info site and port it very quickly across its product lines. So that mm -hmm. says to me it was a modern architecture. You know, I'm sure mm -hmm. API, microservices, and all those, all those cool buzzwords. But but that mm -hmm. the proof is in the, their ability to to bring that IP to other parts of the uh, of the portfolio. So well done. Yeah, well, thanks. Appreciate that. I mean, you know, they've got a fantastic team there. Um, and the other thing that that helps is, you know, when you, when you have the notion that you don't just build on top of the data, 
you extract the data, you structure it, you put that in a database. We use Vertica there for that. And then you build on top of that. That just taking the time to build that layer is what lets you build a scalable sort of platform. Yeah, so you know why Vertica? I mean, Vertica's been around for a while. You remember you had the you had the old RDBMS, uh, you know, Oracle's DB2, SQL Server, and then the database was kind of a boring market. And then all of a sudden you had the all these MPP companies came out, a spate of them. They all got acquired, including Vertica, and they've all sort of you know disappeared and you know morphed into different brands that and, and Microfocus Microfocus has preserved the Vertica brand. Uh -huh. uh, and it seems like Vertica has has able been able to survive the 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 transitions. Why Vertica? What was it about that platform that that was unique and interested you? Well, I mean, so they're the first one to build what I would call a real column store that's that's kind of market capable, right? So, so there was the Seesaw project at Berkeley, uh, which Stonebreaker was involved in, and then right. that became sort of the seed from which Vertica was spawned. So, so you had this idea of, you know, let's, let's lay things out in a columnar way. And, and then when I say columnar, I don't just mean that the data for every column is in a different set of files. Um, what I mean by that is sort of, you know, it takes full advantage of things like run length encoding, and belt file encoding, and block dict compression. And so you end up with these massive orders of magnitude savings in terms of the data that's being pulled off of uh, storage, as well as as it's moving through the pipeline. Uh, internally in Vertica's query processing. So why am I saying all this? Because it's it's fundamentally a, it was a fundamentally disruptive technology. Um, I think column stores are ubiquitous now in analytics, um, and I think you're you, there. You could name maybe a couple of, of projects which are mostly open open source who do something like Vertica does, but they name me another one that's actually capable of serving an enterprise as a as a relational database. I still think Vertica is unique in being that being that one. Well, it's interesting because you know, you're a startup and so a lot of startups would say, okay, we're going with a with a born in the cloud database. Now, Vertica touts that well, look, we we've embraced cloud. You know, we we have we run in the cloud, we run on prem, mm -hmm. you know, all different optionality. Uh, and and you hear a lot of vendors say that but a lot of times they're just taking their stack and stuffing it into the cloud. Mm -hmm. But but so why didn't you go with a cloud native database? And is Vertica, you know, able to? I mean, obviously that's why you chose them. But I, I'm I'm interested from a technologist standpoint as as okay. to, you know, why you again made that choice uh, given all these other choices around there. Right. I mean, again, I, I'm not I, so. As I explained a column store, which I think is the appropriate definition, I'm not aware of a, of another cloud native column yeah. store. So mm, okay. I'm aware of other cloud native transactional databases. I'm not aware of one that has the analytics uh, performance. And I've, I've tried some of them. So, so it's not like I didn't look. What I was actually impressed with, and, and I think what let me move forward using Vertica in our stack is the fact that Eon really is built from the ground up to be cloud native. And so we've been using Eon uh, you know, almost ever since we started uh, the work that we're doing. So, so I've been really happy with the performance and and with the reliability of Eon. So, it's interesting. Yeah. I've been saying for years that Vertica is a diamond in the rough, and its its previous owner didn't know what to do with it because it got distracted. And now Microfocus yeah. seems to really see the value and is obviously putting some investments in there. Um, yeah. Tell me more about. Uh, your business, uh, who are you disrupting? Uh, are you kind of disrupting the do it yourself or is there sort of a, a, a big whale out there that you're going to you know, go after? Add some color to that. Yeah, so, so our, our broader market is, mar is uh, monitoring software. That's the kind of the high level category. Uh, okay. And so you have a lot of people in that market right now. Some of them are entrenched in large players like Datadog would be a great example. Some of them are smaller upstarts. Um, it's it's a it's pretty you know it's a pretty saturated market. But what's happened over the last I'd say two years is that there's been sort of a push towards what's called observability in terms of uh, at least how some of the products are architected, like Honeycomb, and and how some of them are messaged. Uh, most of them are messaged these days. And what that really means is there's been sort of an understanding that's that's developed that that MTTR is really 
is really what people need to focus on to keep to keep their customers happy. If you're a SaaS company, MTTR is going to be your bread and butter, and it's still measured in hours and days. And and the biggest reason for that uh, is is because of what's called unknown unknowns, because of complexity. Nowadays, things are applications are ten times as complex as, as they used to be. Uh, and what you end up with is a situation where if something is new, if it's a known issue with a known symptom and a known root cause, then, you know, you can set up uh, automation for it. Um, but but the ones that really cost a lot of time in terms of in terms of service disruption are unknown unknowns. And now you got to go dig into this massive mess of data. So so observability is about making tools to help you do that. But it's still going to take you hours. And so our contention is you need to automate the eyeball. The, the bottleneck is now the eyeball. And, and so you have to get away from this notion of a person's going to be able to do it infinitely more efficiently and recognize that you need automated help. When you get an alert, it, it shouldn't be that, hey, something weird's happening. Now go dig in. It should be, uh, here's, here's a root cause and, and the symptom. And that should be proposed to you by, by a system that actually does the observing. It actually does the watching, and that's what that's what Zebrium does. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, you're right. You, you know, the last thing you want is just another alert, and you say, "Go figure something out," because there's a problem. So, how yeah. does it work, Larry? In terms of what you what you built there, could you take us inside the covers? Yeah, sure. So, you know, the so there's really right now there's two kinds of data that we're that we're ingesting. There's metrics and there's log files. Um, mm -hmm. so metrics, there's actually sort of a framework that's really uh, popular in sort of DevOps circus, circles especially, but, but it's becoming popular everywhere, which is called Prometheus. And uh, it's a way of exporting metrics so that scrapers can collect them. And so you'll, like, if you go look at a typical stack, you'll find that most of the open source components and many of the closed source components are going to have exporters that export all their stats to Prometheus. So by supporting that stack, we can bring in all of those metrics. Um, and then there's also the log files. And so you've got host log files in a containerized environment. You've got container logs and you've got application specific logs, perhaps living on a host mount. And you want to pull all those back and you want to be able to associate sort of, okay, this log, that I've collected here is associated with the same container on the same host that, that this metric is associated with. But now what? So once you've got that, you've got a pile of unstructured logs. So what we do is we take a look at those logs. And we say, let's structure those into tables, right? So where I used to have a, a sort of a log message, if I look in my log file and I see it says something like, you know, X happened five times, right? Well, that, that event type is going to occur again, and it'll say X happened six times or X happened three times. So if I see that as a human being, right, I can say, oh, clearly that's the same thing. And what's interesting here is the times that X, that this, that X happened and that this, this number, right, I, wanna, I, may not, I may want to know when the numbers happened as a time series, the values of that column. And so you can Im imagine it as a table. So now I have a table for that event type, and every time it happens, I get a row. And then I have a column with that number in it. And, and so now I can do any kind of analytics I want almost instantly across my, if I have all my event types structured that way, everything changes. You can, you can do real anomaly detection and incident detection on top of that data. So that's really how we go about doing it, how we go about being able to do autonomous monitoring in a way that's effective. How do you handle, um doing that for like bespoke app you have to do, does somebody have to build a connector to those apps or how, how do you, no, how do you handle that yeah that's a really good question so you're right so like uh, you know so if i go in and install a typical sort of log manager there'll be connectors for different apps and usually what that means is pulling in the stuff on the left uh, uh, if you were to be looking at that log line and it'll be things like a timestamp or a severity or a function name or various other things and so the connector will know how to pull those apart uh, and then the stuff to the right will be considered the message, and that'll get sort of indexed for search. Um, and, and so our approach is we actually go in with machine learning, we structure that whole thing. So there's a table, and it's going to have a column called, called severity and timestamp and uh, you know function name, and then it's going to have columns that correspond to the parameters that are in that event, and it'll have a name associated with, with sort of a, the constant parts of that, that event. And so you end up with a situation where you've structured all of it automatically. 
So we don't need collectors. It'll work just as well on your homegrown app that has no that has no collectors or no parsers to find or anything. It'll work immediately just as well as it would work on anything else. And that's important, right? Because you can't be asking people uh, for connectors to their own application. It's just it becomes now they've got to stop what they're doing and go go write code for you for your platform and they have to maintain it. It's just untenable. So you can be up and running with our service in three minutes. It'll just be monitored for you. That's awesome. I mean, that is really a, a, a breakthrough innovation. So uh, nice. L love to see that hitting the market. Um, yeah. Who do you sell to? Uh, uh, both types of companies and, and what role within the company? Oh, well, uh, definitely there's, there's two main sort of pushes that we've seen, or I should say pulls. Um, one is from sort of DevOps folks, um, SRE folks. So these are people who are tasked with monitoring an environment, basically. Uh, and then you've got people who are in engineering uh, and they have a staging environment. And what they actually find valuable is, because when we find an incident in a staging environment, yeah, half the time it's because, you know, they're tearing everything up and it's not release ready, whatever's in stage. That's fine. They know that. But the other half the time, it's it's new bugs. It's issues. And they're finding issues. So it's it's kind of diverged. Like you have engineering users, and I would they're not they don't have titles like QA, they're 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 dev engineers or dev managers that are really interested. And then you've got uh sort of DevOps and SRE people that are interested. Go and then how do I consume your product? It's just a SaaS, I sign up, and you said within three minutes I'm up and running and yeah. I'm paying yeah. by the drink. <laughs> right. So so there's a couple ways. So right. So the, the easiest way is if you use Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is what's called a container orchestrator. So these days, sure. so you know Docker and containers and all that. So 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 now there's you know container orchestrators have become uh, I wouldn't say ubiquitous, but they're they're very popular now. So it's kind of it's kind of going it's kind of on that inflection curve. Uh, it's, I, I'm not exactly sure the penetration, but I'm going to say thirty to probably of, mm -hmm. of shops that we're interested in are using container orchestrators. So if you're using Kubernetes, basically you can install our Kubernetes chart, um, which basically means copying and pasting the URL and so on into your into your little admin uh, panel there. And then uh, and then it'll just start collecting all the logs and metrics, and then you just log in on the website. And the way you do that is just go to our website, and you and it'll show you how to sign up for the service and You'll get your little API key and the, the link to the chart, and you're off and running. You don't have to do anything else. You can add rules. You can add stuff. In, but you don't have to. You shouldn't have to, right? You should never have to do any more work. That's great. Um, and as I say, you, so it's a, it's a SaaS uh, capability, and I just I, I pay for How do you price it? Oh, right. So it's it's priced on volume, um, I, I, mm -hmm. data volume. I'm, I don't want to I don't want to go too much into it because I'm not the pricing guy, but, but what I'll say is that it's, um, as far as I know, it's as cheap or cheaper than any other uh, log manager or um, sort of metrics product. It's, it's in that same neighborhood as the very low priced ones. Because right now, we're not like, we're not trying to, you know, optimize for take. We're trying to, you know, make a healthy margin and get the, get the value of autonomous monitoring out there right now. That's our priority. And it's running in in the cloud, is that right? Uh, AWS. Uh, yeah, that's right? Right. yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I should also, I should have also pointed out you can have a free account if it's less than some number of gigabytes a day. We're not going to charge. Yeah, it's run. It so we run in AWS. Uh, we have a multi-tenant instance in AWS, and we have a an a Vertica Eon uh, cluster behind that, uh, and it's it's been working out really well. And on your freemium, you have uh, of the, use the Vertica Community Edition because they don't charge you for that, right? So is that how you do it, or, or? no, no, we're no, no. So so you know, I, I don't want to go into that because I'm not I'm not the biz dev guy. But but what I, but what I'll what I'll what I'll say is that uh, you know that when you if you're doing something that ends up being OEM ish, you you can work out a, the particulars with Vertica. It's not like you're gonna. Just go pay retail, and they, they won't let you distinguish between, you know, test and prod and paid and all that. They, I mean, yeah, they'll I, work. I, you just call them up. Yeah, and that's why I brought it up. Is Vertica? They have a community edition, which is not neutered. It runs Eon. It, it, it just has limits on clusters and, and, limits, and right. storage. But yeah, but it's right, still yeah, it's well, full. So to it's your point, we want, we want a multi-tenant, right? So it's 
it's it's big just because it's multi <laughs> it's multi tenant. Yeah. Right? We have we have hundreds of users on that on that. And then what what's your partnership with with Vertical like? Can you just can we close on that and just describe that a little bit? What's it like? I mean, it's yeah, pleasant. I mean, it's pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, <it's, laughs> I mean, I, but you know what? Like, here's the so the important thing. So the, here's what's important. What's important is that I don't have to worry about that layer of our staff. Like at, when it comes to uh, being able to get the performance I need, being able to get the economy of scale that I need, being able to get the absolute scale that I need, uh, I don't. I've. I've. I have not been disappointed uh, ever with Vertica. And frankly, being able to have acid guarantees and everything else, like a normal mature database that can join lots of tables and still be fast, that's also necessary at scale. And so I feel like uh, it was definitely the right choice, you know, to start with. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I remember in the early days of big data, a lot of people said, who needs, who's going to need these ACID properties and all this complexity of databases? And of course, you know, yeah, ACID properties and SQL became the killer killer features and functions of, yeah. of these databases. Right. Uh, and yeah, then- who, did, who didn't see that one coming, right? Yeah, right. And then- um, so you guys uh, have done a big seed round. You've raised a little over six six million dollars, and uh, you got the product market fit down. You're you're ready to rock, right? Yeah, that's right. So I mean, so we're doing a launch probably. Well, when this airs, it'll probably be the day before this airs. So basically, yeah. I mean, we're so we finally we've got people. We've got like literally in the last I'd say six to eight weeks. It's just been this sort of you know. A, peak of interest all of a sudden everyone kind of gets the gets what we're doing realizes they need it and we've got a solution that seems to meet expectations so it's like it's been an amazing let me just say this it's been an amazing start to the year i mean at the same time it's been really difficult uh for us but more difficult for some other people that you know haven't been able to um go to work over the last couple of weeks and and, and so on but uh it's been, you know, a good start to the year, at least for for our business. So great. Well, Larry, congratulations on on getting the company off the ground, and and thank you so much for coming on the Cube and being part of the virtual Vertica Big Data Conference. Thank you very much. All right, and thank you for everybody for watching. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube. Keep it right there. We're covering wall to wall virtual Vertica BDC. You're watching the Cube. Mm -hmm.